Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elvira Rakov, and I'm very happy to welcome today Mauricio Uribe from Compressed Air Consultant uh, on our podcast, uh, on our energy movement platform. Hi, Mauricio. How are you? Hello. Fine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just, for our listeners to tell that uh, I met Mauricio also through our common colleague, Paul. You can see also his, and listen, his. Uh, uh, interview uh, on our YouTube channel, but Mauricio brings uh, amazing insight uh, on the compressed air room control. And wherever I would have some questions about the very complicated diagrams, uh, I would call you and just ask the questions. <laughs> and what do you think about the, all the data? So today, Mauricio, I would like to talk about your experience in the audits and uh, in general, what what you experienced in all these years. Could you please just tell uh, tell us about yourself a little bit, oh, just well, your background? Yeah, I graduated from college uh, in the past century. Uh, <laughs> and I started working for, well, in, in research, then I started working for Nexoran back in 1992. Um, I worked with IR in several positions in different countries until 2006. And then I started my own company. And uh, well, about uh, 10 years later, I started working together with Paul. Um, and now I'm part of a, of a compressor consultants. So that's- uh, So I usually, I, I usually ask everyone, how did you end up with compressed air? <laughs> how did I land in compressed air? Um, no, actually, I, I I wanted at the time I was working at the uh, in, in college in a, a research project in biomedical engineering, which was fascinating. Uh, but then I I decided to go to the wider world, so I I worked as a financial consultant of all possible opportunities for a couple of years. And then I wanted to basically become the engineer I had studied for. And uh, Inger Sorand uh, offered me a, a job. And uh, then that, that was the gate into this fascinating world. Okay. So I would like to talk with you about your consultancy work. So basically uh, what you do, you do the uh, uh, audits of compressed air room, of control. So what is your what, what is your focus for the, for the audits? Well, we... We share a common focus in, uh, for the audits in compressor consultants. And, and uh, the thing is, we uh, try to minimize the air consumption. Mm -hmm. um, and then we optimize the supply side to that reduce demand. So it's uh, basically less cubic meters of air and less uh, euros per cubic meter. Combine them both and we got the best, the best of both worlds. Yeah. And is it uh, industry specific to work with some specific industries or in general it's for, for all types of industries? work with all kinds of industries. Sometimes the market throws us from one industry to another, but uh, I mean, we have done a lot of cement plants, uh, food and beverage, packaging. That's uh, like the main ones, but we have also done pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, uh, car industry, auto parts, all kinds of industries, uh, you know, animal, food, pellets, all, all those, those things. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I wanted to ask you maybe more like provocative questions uh, now <laughs> about about the audit side, because um, I do, in my experience, it's mostly in the detail, the application, so basically a demand side. Uh, there are auditors that do more supply side and only compress their room, so basically they just focus on on that some of the auditors do the leak detection and the and the leak repair uh, as far as understood you do both you do the demand side and then you do also the adjustment of the of the supply side to the to the demand right yeah, that's, we, we do both yeah uh, and uh, how usually customers react on this because uh, from my experience i saw that customers that they say okay uh, you are a compressed air auditor, you go into the compressor room and just do something there. But the moment you uh, take the holistic approach, I feel sometimes the customers can be hesitant on that side. Uh, it's uh, it's difficult to, to convey the initial 
message of what an audit encompasses. Um, initially, when you talk about demand side, everyone thinks leaks. You know, yes. it's, uh, I mean, you go with a fancy ultrasonic instrument and detect leaks, that's a detective work. That's interesting, that's, that's nice. Uh, the other demand side issues are less glamorous, so to speak. So you have to just understand how the process works and, and uh, uh, also identify the instances where they are just uh, wasting compressed air. So uh, for example, a setting on a dust collector that, that, that is off, uh, off what, the, what it should be, um, or um, sometimes an application that uh, wastes uh, air into the atmosphere um, without, I mean, needlessly and for, for a long time, or a uh, air lens that is being left, you know, open just mm -hmm. to be able to fluidize a lot of, of, of product all the time. So those those kind of, of applications you identify, and those are like the easiest one to uh, explain to customers. But usually, back to what, what I was saying is, usually it takes a while to, to convey the message of what we do, because what we do changes so much from one audit to the next. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example, customers ask, OK, what's your plan for today? Well, my plan for today is to see these areas, but sometimes in one of those areas that you that you thought you would spend like eight hours, you, you end up spending, you know, 16 hours or maybe four. It, it depends on how, how much you can find over there. And um, yeah, well, the, the, the only thing is you have to be thorough. You have to, if, if you see something that, that, that doesn't add up, you have to, go ahead and probe that until until you understand uh, what the application or the waste is. Sometimes you find nothing. Sometimes you find, wow, a huge opportunity. Do you have some in mind the huge opportunities that you found in the last project? Just something like, I don't know, percentage or application or something that the customer forgot to switch off and then, uh, or, or the application was designed already in, in the wrong way? Oh, it was... I mean, it was massive. It's it's a once in an auditor's lifetime uh, <laughs> opportunity, and it happened last year. Uh, there was a system that um uh, had I mean the air consumption for a particular application was in the range of six thousand uh, normal cubic meters per hour, and uh, they could reduce that to half as much because they they it, it was a process application and they were um feeding air to it at a much higher pressure than required mm -hmm. and uh the thing is that they had different areas and the area that was in charge of production they said no 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 just give me as much air all the the, the highest pressure you can just give it to me yeah. I, I i don't i don't want a minimum pressure or anything and the thing is that uh, the system was wildly over i mean over the consumption was was over the top so twice as much in that range so that's about uh, 300 400 kilowatts easy mm -hmm. so as i said that that's a, a, an eye opening uh, case and uh, we found out uh, because we we measured well, we measured everything. Uh, so uh, at that point, we we measured that specific application that wasn't supposed to be that big. Uh, they didn't have flow meters or, or anything. So we installed a flow meter, uh, calibrated flow meter, I have to say. <laughs> and then we we uh, found that out, and uh, well, that that was shocking. And then we could we could see how the flow changed with the pressure. So okay. it was. It was an interesting opportunity there. So, so basically, you analyze the process, and then uh, uh, how do how do you and uh, how this process work from the fact that you just uh, analyze the compressed air system, but then you go into the process, you understand the process, and then you analyze what is the actually actual requirement for this process. Exactly. Sometimes, sometimes they have uh, 
like uh, specific machines, say, for example, the chemical industries or the packaging industries, they might have uh, huge black boxes. I mean, machines with a lot of tubes and everything. You've seen them. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, they, they don't know what happens in there. So there's a lot of actuators and, and everything yeah. that, uh, I mean, we don't go into modeling those, uh, but we do uh identify the main opportunities over there i mean we we could obviously go ahead and understand them and model them and, and uh, but that's usually outside of of the scope of what we offer right now yes it's a <laughs> yeah to work yeah. together that's true yes. and this yeah. is basically the what you're always talking about it's uh like mostly it's the all on the demand side is the oversizing of the application right so it's like oversizing of uh uh, actuators getting like more uh, pressure, uh, higher pressure that is required, like requiring also the higher flows for those uh, for those operations. Um, how customer reacts when you tell them that they are using it too much? Because what I found out that sometimes um, uh, people get it to as a critique. So that uh, because it's a maintenance manager or the process uh, engineers who are responsible for the for the process, and then you come to them and you say, okay, listen, instead of a six thousand cubic meter, you actually need three thousand cubic meter here, uh, even though they say no, we need to because this oversizing and those safety factors I I seen in my experience, it was like factor five you know, or factor two or three for actuators that consumes even 50% 50, 50 more or, I don't know, 200% uh, yeah. more that, that is actually required. But then when you say it to the customer, they like a little bit, yeah, but this is this is our process. So this is how, how we design it, how we thought about it or how our uh, supplier of the equipment, for example, thought about it. How do you overcome this barrier of not criticizing it, but rather helping it? Because maintenance manager and energy managers, it's sometimes it, very often it's two different people, <laughs> two different tasks. They have two different KPIs. And when the process doesn't care how much uh, you pay for, how much they pay for compressed air, the energy manager who hired you there actually like cares about it. So can you yeah. say something on that side? Yeah. At the at the beginning of, of my career as an auditor, we, I mean, I, I found that to be a, a huge issue because people turn to be defensive when when you talked about uh, you know the the errors, especially because the, the person in charge of compressed air is the one that makes the decision re decisions related to compressed air, and uh, so if there's a bad decision, that's his fault. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the the, the general the general uh, mindset. However, uh, what we have learned, we have learned to listen because there's there's also always a reason for, for doing things the way that things have been done. Um, many times the, the, the reason is just a misunderstanding or uh, a bit of panic. I mean, if, if someone has had a... Uh, problem where the plant stopped because one compressor went off and there was no backup. Uh, they they will become so scared about that that they won't hesitate to have a compressor running and loaded just in case so that it reacts very quickly. And that that has happened in, in, in I mean I, I've seen that happen. So um, when you say okay we you, you can you can just put a big receiver here and a, another compressor and then we calculate the receiver pressure everything oh can i do that yeah and the savings paid for the receiver for the controls for everything so uh uh th there's the store the, the the story behind that and, and, and you need to understand it uh in, in this case uh the story is that pressure was fluctuating so the, the production guy didn't care about the rest of the plant so he didn't want any regulator or anything he just wanted as much pressure as they, as they could as they could get so once once you once you understand what's happening behind that uh it, it uh, allows you to present the solution and to understand the problem and, and to explain the roots of a problem because we we usually have before we start an audit we have a meeting with uh 
several people at the plant uh, where we can uh, get to know what the problems are. We can uh, also understand uh, the usage and their opinion of, of different people, but also we can set a, uh, or, or we can ask for some amnesty period for anything that had been done in the past. Because, I mean, if, if you didn't take into account some interactions between the system's uh, components, mm -hmm. which is exactly the point in here, um, then, I mean, you're not to blame for any wrong decisions that you could make because you, you, you thought you were doing the right thing buying a lot of new compressors. Um, and you didn't need them, so that's 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 one of the things. Uh, so once we have established that in, uh, amnesty environment, we can talk freely about that, and then we also care to understand what why the things happen. So when we are in the out briefing or in the report, we can explain. Okay, this happened because of this and this and this, and uh, the solution is this. But uh, I mean. The, there's no one actually to blame because everyone was doing the, what, what they thought the best. Yeah, yes, exactly. No, I think it's also when you talk with the operators, you always find the ways how you can help them. So very often in 99% cases, uh, energy efficiency is also well-operated system. So when you help them to, uh, and remove some problems, solve some problems for the operators, for maintenance managers, from pressure fluctuations, I know, so from blowing applications or from the actuators, then they are actually happier. <laughs> and the yeah. result of this is the uh, system that works correct. That's true. Actually, when 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 you when you involve operators and when operators understand how how expensive it is to make air and, and to spend air, they themselves will come with a different approach. Uh, for example, uh, I remember a case where they had a isolation valve. For a um, for a fluidization application that was, I mean, you had to climb a ladder and then another ladder and then close the valve. And uh, the maintenance guy was uh, about my size, which is difficult to to handle in in the small ladders. And uh, uh, when when he understood how how difficult it was to, to, I mean, how expensive it was. Uh, he came up with a solution. Hey, I should move the vault down here so I can actually from where, where I am. So, I mean, those are easy fixes, but they make a difference because it, it's the difference between wasting air and, and not wasting air, so. Yes. And uh, I would like to go now into the compressor room. So once we talked with operators and understood also the demand side and, and waste the, uh, waste uh, things that were wasted there. Uh, how do you usually work in the compre in the compressor room? How do you adjust the demand? Like, do you have some projects where you just simply switch off compressors uh, that are not required there? Do you need to is uh, is there like huge investment uh, for the control? What are usually the ROI on those projects? So how do, how does it work? It's for the compressor room, it's different every time. Uh, sometimes you you have. Um, I remember clearly one of my first audits. Uh, I they 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 had three compressors in a compressor room, and the three compressors were on. So the customer was saying, "We bought these machines, and they were supposed to be, you know, two running, one backup, but mm -hmm. the three compressors are running all the time." So. I installed the loggers. That was one of my first audits. So I, I was fascinated at the, at the result. Uh, when I saw the data, actually two compressors were making air and one was unloaded, but then pressure changed. And one of these that, that were loaded, unloaded, and the one that wasn't loaded, loaded. So it was like a braid of three oh. compressor lines. Um, they took turns and, and fought each other to, to to make air. So all three of them were on all the time. Although one was permanently unloaded and that one changed from one compressor to another, uh, there were there were three compressors running and, and uh, a, a constant compressor, uh, compressors running constantly unloaded. Uh, so we were able to, to change that just by changing the pressure settings. Uh, another option if in the new controllers is just to, to make them talk to each other so they know when to get the other one. And that requires no external control system. 
um, in more complex system uh, systems, you will need an external control system. Uh, with centrifugal compressors, when you have many centrifugal compressors, you need a system that uh, is capable of load sharing. Otherwise, you just uh, run one of the compressors in blow off mode. So it's uh, it changes with everything, with the technologies that you have there. Mm -hmm. but, and uh, uh, t talking about this, because uh, there are sometimes on market uh, like very, let's say, interesting monitoring system also for the control room. Mm -hmm. uh that can uh that can i don't know if they can optimize something or not or they just like monitor it and uh see the see the curves and then the engineer or maintenance manager can can, can have a decision on itself um so what do you think about the, uh permanent monitoring and also some algorithms that already exist now to to integrate this i mean I'm what I'm trying to say that there have been a lot of discussion recently also on my LinkedIn page on the AI and artificial intelligence and the control of compressor room. I think we're way, way far from this, but uh, I just wanted to have your opinion in, in general on, on that. So do, do we always need like Mauricio to come and check and to set like optimal control, optimal controls, or there are already some uh, automatic uh, audits uh, and uh, algorithms that can do it? Well, let's let's start with that. Um, I I don't get tired of saying every plant is different. So uh, I mean the the, the profile the load profile of the plant um, is 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 different. It, it varies according to the type of business or or, or production shifts or even altitude. I mean, it's, it, they, they 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 change because of uh, there are many factors that inside. Uh, so, if you were going to apply artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, works by by getting a lot of data and, and, and optimizing uh, and seeing how how people react or how they they should react to uh, different conditions. But they they need just a lot of data. The thing is that not all data available or 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 wildly collected if, if they could collect uh, data from every application would be applicable to that specific process or that specific plant. So uh, they would need to go uh, through a uh, initial stage of, you know, machine learning, but collecting the uh, data specifically for that uh, plant and seeing what, uh, and, and basically watching the decisions that people make or that the operator or, or anyone trained makes in order to adapt the best configuration of compressors to the demand uh, uh, profile and how the demand profiles change from one to another. Sometimes at lunch break, uh, you have a lower air consumption or just before lunch break, you have a huge air peak because people are cleaning their workstations, things like that. So um, ideally, the, the, the system should be able to identify and or predict those, those uh, 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 specific events. Uh, because the idea, when, when you're controlling a compressed air system, the idea is to minimize waste, right? So you, you get the mix of compressors with a size that, are, that allow you to work let, let's talk about uh, rotary screw compressors that, that allow you to work with uh, most compressors fully loaded and then one trimming. Yeah. And that trim compressor, the size of that trim compressor should be enough to, to cover the, the, the band width of, of the variations that you have in flow. Um, sometimes that's they're, they're too big, so you need tanks, things like that. So mm -hmm. in order to optimize the system, we analyze that load profile. We, we suggest what the, 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 the system should be. And then the controls that could take, you know, uh, word from AI and everything, uh, they should choose the mix of compressors based on the, on the demand, uh, on the application, on the, yeah, on the, on the demand profile. Yes. Yeah. I think demand profile, it's impossible to do this kind of things, optimization. I mean, to, to choose also a configuration of compressor, the optimal one, you also don't need artificial intelligence. You can just have the algorithms that set up yeah. for this. 
to yeah, to this. The problem is that that you know artificial intelligence. You need to make sure that that you're you're making. It, it's like everything. It's like the, the same. The operator. I mean, the operator knows the system, knows how it's going to work, so he takes educated guesses. That's that's predicting and preparing for for things. Yes. And and we need to make sure that the these are educated guesses as well. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And they and they're trained on everything, not just on the control side, but also like on the uh, on the demand side, because it's uh, it's yeah, it's approximation. So those algorithms, it's uh, approximation. Yeah. Yeah, well, the demand side is is more. Uh, I don't think it requires any any dynamic intelligence, except for very few applications where you can have, for example, pulsating air or something like that. But yeah, yes, it was. Uh, it's. Uh, I had a recently very funny case when um, um, it was a steel manuf uh, aluminium manufacturer fac uh, factory, and um, it was a huge peak between four and six a.m of 1000 cubic meter per hour. Wow. So, and then if you just see, so it's a thousand cubic meter per hour, it, it's it's a lot. And uh, the full consumption is about 4,000. Uh, and um, um, then the, our, the monitoring system, or the, the, the guys that were before there, they, they checked the, the data and they said, ah, you need here uh, to avoid it, you need to, to compensate it maybe like with the smaller compressor this side, because it also was causing pr pressure drops. So they like, Proposed the system uh, like for, for the for, for the compensation of it, and uh, and then when we were there, so uh, walking around and talking to the operators, <laughs> just found out that the speaker was that um, the, when the operator was coming to them, his name his name is uh, <laughs> Giovanni, uh, he was coming to the machine. Uh, it was very the the factory is outside basically, so it has a huge area that it has just a roof, you know. So but it's mostly like outside and he had a huge he has still a huge uh, hose to remove fog <laughs> so because he was starting his operation at uh, uh, five or six so he would come at four drinking coffee and then he would remove a fog around this machine from four to six and and of course like instead of instead of this to explain like, here you probably should use a fan you know it's not the compressed air but yeah, yeah. another like a blower <laughs> just something just to use a fan to remove fog uh, and he's like, ah, oh, yeah, it's actually like a good thought, you know, because also with compressor, I can't like remove everything because I think pressure is not enough. So I was thinking to ask like for more, for more pressure. It was um, almost a comical situation, but I yeah. think that the most comical side of this was that the system before, or, like the auditors before, don't want to criticize them. It's just like the idea that they look take took a look only on the data from the compressor compressor room. They said, ah, oh, you need to, comp to compensate like exactly. the compressor here to comp comp compensate the pressure drop. And I'm thinking that AI <laughs> in the future, when we do this kind of things, actually has to talk with the operators first uh, on asking how they use the compressed air, you know? And, uh, but I mean, the, the fog removal at 4 a.m. is something, exactly. something that I couldn't imagine. Especially because no auditors uh, will be around at 4 a.m. Exactly. <laughs> so they, I mean, you, you you don't get to 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 actually see what's happening. So yeah, that's that's one of the things. Uh, sometimes you you have to 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 talk a lot to to people. That's that's true. That's that's also something we have we have learned. Understand, talk, all those soft non-engineering skills that that you really need to to yeah. get to yeah, understand yes. how things yes. work. Also on, on on the settings, for example, sometimes we see. Uh, compressors that that cycle too much, and that's because you don't allow a, a, a wide enough pressure band for regulation, uh, especially when you have a cleanup like dryers and filters system. So, if the dryers and and, and filters uh, have a uh, say 0 0.7 and 0 0.7 bar uh, pressure drop, that pressure drop is is you will see that only when air is flowing through those components. So when the compressor is loaded, you have a pressure drop. When the compressor is unloaded, you have zero pressure drop across it. So uh, if, if you take the load and load settings of the compressor and deduct the, the pressure drop from the, from the cleanup system, if you, if you, if you have a, a pressure band that's not wide enough, you will have the compressor constantly cycling. We see that very often. So mm. that's how do you how you how do you solve this kind of problem? Increase the pressure band of compressors. 
So you actually have a working pressure band over there. But that can not always be done because of the system configuration or the compressed pressure rating. Mm -hmm. So um, ideally, if 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 we could handle uh, do do what we what we want, uh, we would like to to run all the system on the dry side pressure after the cleanup equipment. That way, you take into account all the effects of the cleanup, and uh, and then the the compressor runs at it. I mean, it, it doesn't get some false load uh, signals like it would happen with with uh, a small pressure band. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, that's very interesting. So it's uh, uh, just like coming also like to the to the end of our interview. There are so many points to discuss. I think we should do the workshop in the future <laughs> uh, with with you explaining uh, so many effects. Um, in general, like I ask also other people that come here. What do you think about the future of compressed air? Do you believe that it's going to be? I, I know that the compressed air auditors will say that it will never be replaced because you see so many applications that you hardly can imagine something something else. But like uh, in in general, you know, with all this uh, energy efficiency initiatives and uh, with the fact that the compressed air is abused uh, so many times and it used to remove fog, like pressurized air yeah. and uh, cleaning cleaning shoes. Uh, and those kind of things, like where where the industry is going now, and where actually we should go. Are we like on the same path with this or not? Uh, the thing is, well, compressed air, as you said, is a huge uh, consumer of energy, and 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 it's uh, the the least efficient form of energy that 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 you can find in factory, actually. But but it's necessary for for many applications. So it's. Um, I mean, if we can grow people's awareness uh, on on how wasteful it is, they would just use it for for the for what needs to be to be used. So, if if you get to choose a uh, between a uh, electric pump motor pump and a pneumatic diaphragm pump, for example, I mean there are, there are cases where you have to use the the, the diaphragm pump, but not not always. Many many times you see people use them because it's easier or more practical uh, because the airline is over there, and so it's it's. I mean, if, if we are really committed to save energy, we should see less and less uh, compressor usage to do mechanical work. But uh, again. It's it's uh, one of the most efficient ways to clean filters, for example. So you you have to 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 do that now. In terms of the future of compressed air, of course there are, there are, I mean the the OEMs the, the compressor manufacturers are striving to make more efficient compressors, uh, which is good of course, uh, but it's 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 not enough actually. The uh, impact of uh, the uh, compressor in system with many compressors uh, is uh, more tied, more directly tied to its ability to play with the rest and be integrated into a larger system than to be inherently more um, efficient. Mm -hmm. so, yes. And uh, yeah, not not every compressor is good for every application that's that's obviously uh something that that that's a basic uh thought but anyway um so uh the integrability and uh, from from the compressed their auditors i mean we expect i mean we would like all compressor auditors to to i mean to raise the standard of, of compressed air auditing sometimes we find people that really don't know much about what they're talking about and that's bad for the industry in general because they give compressor auditing a bad name on the one hand. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, well, we would like everyone to be able to recommend things that you know do the customer good. Although we would like to remain better than the rest. <laughs> well, I think everyone has their own place, but I think also to find just to be more conscious, uh, you know, not just like a selling some some product uh, behind it that makes. Uh, more sense and to have some neutral audit so this is very important yeah that that's i mean you you cannot you cannot generalize but uh when when 
when audits are are, are being made to uh, only only from the supply side and from a company that offers equipment um sometimes they fall into the temptation of you know trying to sell the equipment but most often is because they come with with a mindset that they have to add something to the system yeah. and uh, what we if, if i were to sum up in, in one word uh, what we do is subtracting i mean we 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 subtract compressors from the system we turn compressors off so that's yeah. That's the name of the game. That's that's. Yes, <laughs> it's all about saving. It's, yeah. it's all about money, right? It's, 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 it's all like about it. money. It's about money, not air. That's that's our motto. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Mauricio. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very interesting today, and I hope in the future we can talk more on the technical side and see more of your use cases. Thanks sure. so much. That's fun. Thank you. Thank you.